Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is Sunday, December 20th, 2020, and I am Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, joining Dan through Zoom. Hey, Dad. Hey, everybody. Hey, Mary Diana. It's always a pleasure to be here on a Sunday afternoon and talk to the good people. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, my dad is going to just pick up where he left off last week, is what he said. So I'm starting the timer, Dad, and I will let you take it away. Well, you know, what I'm trying to do is to use some locally significant people to really talk about big ideas. And I'll, I'll get back to doing more, more in-depth local stuff, although that takes a lot of time and energy. But I'm gonna be starting out talking about a little bit more about James, James Knox Polk. Now you might remember from last time, and I'll go up here just a minute and just sort of remind us of where we were last week. You remember James K. Polk was uh, born in a log house. By the way, log, a lot of people like to call them log cabins. They built these houses out of log because wood was everywhere. It was the cheapest way to build it and nails were manufactured. They weren't manufactured, they were handmade. They were very expensive. So it was cheaper to build houses this way. So you don't call them log cabins. You call them log houses because okay. that's what people lived in. And he, of course, as you remember last time, provoked a war with Mexico, annexed Texas to tick the Mexicans off. Therefore, the war started. And therefore, James K. Polk sent an American army down, invaded Mexico, took Mexico City, and of course, got what we know now as California, Nevada, Utah, most of Colorado, the panhandle of Oklahoma, all of Texas, all of New Mexico, and not all of Arizona. So, and you remember his commitment to this thing called Manifest Destiny, that uh, America had been singled out by God Almighty to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And I go back down now to this where I was. And this, <clears throat> By the way, the, the date these, this event occurred at the Polk Birthplace Restoration, right outside Pineville. This was the official opening, the official dedication. And the person who came to give the talk was the wife of Lyndon Baines Johnson, which certainly was quite a challenge. And she went, of course, by the nickname Lady Bird. So everybody called her Lady Bird Johnson. Very nice lady, very smart, very intelligent. She was basically a school teacher and she married this uh, rascal and thereby got to be the first lady. And she came to give the speech. And it was a, you know, it was a, a, a big occasion. They picked the 20th of May for the official opening of the James Knox Polk Birthplace Memorial, because that was the date of the alleged Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. You know, there is this um, belief that Mecklenburg County was the first place in the colonies to declare their independence from Great Britain. I'm not going to get into the controversy about that. I get into enough controversies as it is, but there's no definitive proof. But you know, they had the American flag. This is all to be a patriotic thing. Now, the bigger issue that I wanted to sort of talk about was the issue of the fact that history is not the past, it's interpreting the past. Now, Lady Bird Johnson gave, of course, a speech, and it was a patriotic speech. She never mentioned Mexico. She never mentioned the Mexican War. She never mentioned the fact that this man basically killed a whole bunch of Mexicans, that he, he, he grasped by military might all of this territory from Mexico 
that he signed a treaty with the British to get what we now call Washington and Oregon. No mention of that, no mention of manifest destiny. You know, historic facts are like, um, they're like beads. You know how you make a necklace out, out of beads? You can mm -hmm. get, a, get a string and you can put different things on it. Yeah. Well, that's sort yeah. of what historic facts are. They're like beads and you can put all kinds of beads on your <laughs> necklace. And you can make it look one way or look another way and whatever. Oh, okay. And the thrust sure. that it's she gave to James K. Polk was rags to riches. Hmm. The idea that here this young man, little boy, born in humble origins in a log house in Mecklenburg County, grew up to become the president of the United States of America. So it was this sort of image that the United States is a place where everyone, regardless of their background or regardless of their economic standing, can become a very great person. The American dream. The American dream. Well, right, okay. you have to remember, you say, well, why would she give that kind of a speech? Well, these people that came there didn't want to sit there and get, <laughs> they didn't want to get told that James K. Polk was a war provoker. You know, they wanted to have a happy occasion. And that's what a lot of people want. They want, you know, sort of history to be a, a pleasant story. And that's the beads that they put on that necklace. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, when you think about uh, trying to really teach history, uh, should you do something other than just tell the good stories? And remember, as I've said, history is all about interpretation. And it's all about which beads you choose to put on the string. And I'm going to say that the beads that, that was put on this, that she put on the string that day are not the ones that you're finding being put on the strings today in our contemporary politics. Now, I'm not going to get partisan. I am staying out of it. I have no desire. I'm just saying, really, history has more to say about today than it says about yesterday. And yes, this country was in a different place in May 1968 than it is today in terms yeah, of this sort of historical record, you know. So that's it. Now, you know, there are two. Let me ask you something, Mary Diana. Yeah. What do you what do you think about twenty dollar bills? I mean, do you do you think uh, when you see a if you saw a twenty dollar bill, yeah, laying on the sidewalk, right, and there was nobody, what would you do with it? I'd pick it up. That's happened before. I'd pick it up. I'd pick it up. I'd pick it up. And if there was somebody there that I thought had dropped it, I'd say, hey, but mm -hmm. if there's anybody there, nobody, finders keepers, losers weepers. I'm yeah. going to take that $20 bill. What does it say when you put someone's image on a $20 bill? What does that convey? Now, of course, this is official United States of America printed money. This is done under the U.S. Department of the Treasury. But you have to put something on the bill. You could, could have put a petunia on there if you wanted to, but you put somebody's, what does that have it, to say about that person it, it's in a well right that we have we have presidents on, well for the most part we have presidents on our money but i guess it means they're an important person they're, they're right. an important don't figure you think, don't you think it's somewhat of an affirmation yes that they're, these are these are really great people these we, are we, these we, are historically these significant are people, people. Be, these are these are significant well i think it's more than just significant I think they're pretty, they're kind of elevated, right? I mean, that's my Yes, feeling. yes, I think that's probably, yes. Now, I want you to know that there was, there was a serious, and there is a serious, a new $20 bill is gonna be introduced. They were actually gonna introduce it this year in the year 2020 because it's the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave females the right to vote. 
19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. But they, they didn't get it done. But I'll show you what the new $20 bill is going to look like. It's going to look like, hold on a minute. I know I got it down here somewhere. Down here, see, down here. saw there. Andrew Jackson pictures. There is the new oh. $20 bill. Now, they think they're probably going to bring, bring it out in 2028. Now, oh, would you say, one. when you when you look, now, this is Harriet Tubman. Tubman. Yeah. Now, Harriet Tubman was big in the Underground Railroad. She was big in anti-slavery movement. Would you say there's any significant difference between the image that this is and the one that we just saw of Andrew Jackson? I noticed that it's this one looks like it's a photograph. For one thing, it struck me. Well, but different. let's get more basic. I mean, I mean what are it's the bigger too. First of all, it's a female. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yes, it's female. And secondly, she's black. Yes, right, Isn't that right. Yes. Well, now. What are we saying? What does it indicate? And they think they're probably going to, it might be as late as 2028 before this comes out. And I quite frankly don't know exactly the reasons for the delay. Yeah, it's a long time. Uh, but uh, I think it, you really have to get, you know, that's a big deal to introduce a new $20. It is. I mean, that it's is. a big deal. Right. Now, what does that indicate? that that's going to be the $20 bill instead of Andrew Jackson. Does that indicate anything at all? You mean that they pick the $20 bill? That the, no, that they have a different image on the $20 bill. They're going to put a different one on. We talked about interpretation of the past. We talked about those beads that you put on. Yeah, the yeah. Well, I was thinking about those beads. Does this indicate that there's, don't you think the same thing would hold true for Harriet Tubman that would for Andrew Jackson that you that that you elevate this person yeah this is somebody right. to be admired this is somebody well yes. why do you think they're putting her on and taking Andrew Jackson off well you know Andrew Jackson has some questionable things in his presidency and his past and I but guess didn't they, he have those? Did, didn't he have those uh, in in May of nineteen sixty eight? Well, that's that. Didn't that's that those, beads thing. Didn't he have those forty about. years of fifty? I mean, the past doesn't change. I think he it's did, probably just the idea. Care. I mean, of just having more diverse figures on. Well, on the it's the fact that what's going on is there's a different official interpretation of the history of this country gaining power than was the case 50 years ago. Yeah, I do think that's true. And, you know, I'm not going to say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's not for me to say. I'm not going to get into that. I'm just saying it's a fact. And I'll tell you primarily who was responsible for that fact. It was Lyndon Baines Johnson. And I'll tell you what Lyndon Baines Johnson did that okay. primarily made that a fact. And that is in 1965, he signed the Voting Rights Act, which oh. basically allowed, which really meant that states or portions of states like North Carolina that had a history of suppressing black voters now had to basically get approval for their voting laws by the federal government. Now that changed the whole ball game. Now you were no let let's let's do a little bit of let's do a little bit of uh, let's do a little bit of uh, talking about Andrew Jackson. And, and, and let you were saying you were suggesting that he was uh, somebody who had some warts. Yeah, I think that's true. Well, let's talk about warts. Okay. First of all, there's a very interesting issue about Andrew Jackson. You know, five of the first seven United States presidents were Southerners. George Washington, 
Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, uh, a James Madison, and Andrew Jackson. The only non-Southerners out of the first seven presidents were John mm -hmm. Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams, and they were from Massachusetts. Now, obviously, James K. Polk was a Southerner. He's going to come later, although he was very much a protege of Andrew Jackson. But the South was a very powerful section of the country politically. Once the South lost the Civil War and was not able to withdraw from the United States, which it was endeavoring to do, there were no Southerners elected president until Jimmy Carter. Wow. Because the South basically lost its political power. But before the Civil War, the South was really, in many ways, the most powerful part of the country politically. Now, there's an interesting issue about where Andrew Jackson was born. Now, you see that statue there? See that statue sitting on a horse? I, I've been, I've seen that statue. In where person. have you seen? Where have you seen that? I, statue? I've seen it in person. Do you remember where? Yeah, I was. I can't remember the name of the site, but it's that place, you know, way out five twenty one. It's the Andrew Jackson South Carolina Andrew Jackson State Park mm -hmm, on US right. five twenty one. In fact, all of you dear people who are out there in your COVID madness, you can get in your cars and drive down to the Andrew Jackson State Park. Stay in your car and keep your mask on. Don't go out and conviviate with all kinds of other people. I don't think conviviate's a word, by the way. But okay, what kind of people do we make statues of? Uh, admirable make no people. I'm not going to have any statues. <laughs> You'll be up there beside no the human man away. Lord, I'll be forgotten <laughs> in 15 minutes. But well, what kind of what, what? What do you say when you make a statue out of somebody? Uh, that they should be remembered and yes. uh, admired. Yes. And in fact, the, this plaque is at the at, at that park, mm -hmm. and it makes a very definite statement. It says, "I was born in South Carolina." I've been told at the plantation where on James Crawford lived, about one mile from the Carolina Road, which is five twenty one. Uh, by the way, uh, about an eighth of a mile from the Waxhaw Creek, Andrew Jackson, and then he said in his last will and trust that he was born in South Carolina. You've heard of Waxhaw, hadn't you, Mary? Jane? Sure. Well, you know how you get to Waxhaw, you just go out Providence Road and keep mm -hmm. going, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a town there now that people call Waxhaw, but that's a, that's a 19th century railroad town. That area was known as the Waxhaws, S. And it straddled both sides of the state line. Mm -hmm. And Andrew Jackson had, he lived in a, it, the state line was just like going across the street. I mean, you know, you, you went back and forth all the time. And therefore, it all has to do with where his mama was when that little boy got born, whether he was at one house or another house. Now, there's a strong, strong commitment that South Carolina says he was born in South Carolina. Oh, but that's not the only marker. There's another marker that has one of those log houses on it. Mm -hmm. And this log house is in North Carolina. This marker's in North Carolina. The two markers are probably a mile apart, but the state line happens to go by the two. So yeah. he was born. Now, let me tell you, Andrew Jackson, let's talk a little bit about the circumstances of his boyhood. He was born in 1767. His father died during his mother's pregnancy. 
And when Andrew Jackson was born in 1767, he had two older brothers and a mama. Now, when he was eight years old, the Revolutionary War broke out. Now, let me tell you, a lot of people might not realize this, but do you know that there were more Revolutionary War battles fought in South Carolina than any other colony? Well, I knew that because of you. <laughs> but the thing is, the reason that there were more fought in South Carolina is because in South Carolina, it was a civil war. Mm -hmm. And most of those battles were four people on one side and three people on the other. And they just were fighting each other because there were so many people who were for the king and so many people who were for the patriots. It was very split. Now, you know, you know as well as I do that the most formative period in anybody's life is when they're children. Mm -hmm. Now, I can tell you that Andrew Jackson, if he had had any softness in him, if he had had any true compassion in him, if he had anything but disdain for most of his <laughs> fellow human beings, he would have lost it in his childhood. Because when he was eight years old, he found himself caught up in an incredibly bloody situation. Battle after battle after battle after battle. And Andrew Jackson actually as a child participated in the war because one of the things that was done mm -hmm. was they would use young boys to be runners who would go from one outpost to another carrying messages back and forth. And Andrew Jackson, his, his, I mean, first of all, he grew up very poor. His daddy was dead. During the Revolutionary Wars, both of his brothers died and his mother died and he was orphaned. So, I mean, it was really, if you will, an extremely hard childhood. And he saw people get shot. He saw people get killed. He saw violence. In fact, and the British sent a major army under Cornwallis, General Cornwallis, mm -hmm. inland from Charleston, South Carolina in 1780. And that even made it worse. I mean, I can tell you, he was, he was, ex you know, war brings out the worst in human beings. I mean, it brings out the worst. Sure. He saw death, he saw execution, he saw it all. And I tell you one thing that was fundamental to his being, you know, if you've got an enemy, they either destroy you or you destroy them. He was a, he was a fighter because that's what he was exposed to. In addition to that, one thing that continued throughout his life. And it's interesting because this kind of attitude is, is dissipated now, but it used to be very strong among these early patriots. He hated the British. <laughs> he didn't dislike the British. He hated the British. One of his, one of the people he knew was William R. Davy, or he knew of William R. Davy he was in the same re region. And they said when people would mention the British to William R. Davy, that he'd get sick to his stomach <laughs> with some of the inevitable biological results coming from it. Okay. Now that's the kind, and he was captured by the British near the end of the war. And a British officer told him to shine his boots. And Andrew Jackson, who was, cantankerous to the core uh, said he wouldn't do it and the British officer reached up with his sword and st it started coming down and Andrew Jackson put up his arm to, to block it which he succeeded in doing and he carried the scars throughout his whole life on his arm now that's the kind of rascal that you're talking about mm -hmm. now he is hard he's hard 
Now, there's a, and he lived right in here in our midst. Now, here's a state historic highway marker. It's in Salisbury. Now, Salisbury was the largest town in the colonial backcountry in the late 18th century. And you can see that Andrew Jackson, see, there weren't any law schools in those days. You basically were an apprentice. You studied law. And then you had to pass an exam. Of course, this was now the Revolutionary War was over in 1781. So after the war's over, he's now, you know, 17 years old. He's orphaned. He's poor, practically penniless. But two things about him. In addition to being, I don't want to say mean, but I mean, he's tough. Tough, yeah. Tough. He's also very intelligent. Yeah, I was going to say, must have been smart. Now, if you take somebody who's poor, who is tough, and who is intelligent, you got to brew for some trouble. <laughs> and I mean, he was going to be trouble. Well, he went to Salisbury. There's a great story here, by the way. The office where they they where he studied for the law in Salisbury, which was right there in downtown Salisbury. In the Centennial Exposition that they had in Philadelphia in 1876 to celebrate the 100th anniversary. I see the cat back there. <laughs> I guess our the cat has come to visit. 100, 100, 100th anniversary of the country. They dismantled the law office and shipped it up to Philadelphia. Somehow they lost it up there and never came back. But anyway. <laughs> Andrew Jackson, when he got certified to be a lawyer, was offered a legal position in the new town of Nashville, Tennessee. And so Andrew Jackson moved to Tennessee. Same thing James K. Polk did. A lot of North Carolinians. By the way, a lot of towns in Tennessee are named for North Carolina towns. You wouldn't, there's a Nashville, North Carolina. So they named a Nashville, Tennessee. Oh. Interestingly enough, there's a Chapel Hill, Tennessee. Hmm. There's no university there, but there's a chapel. There's a Murfreesboro, North Carolina. There's a Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So oh, that's okay. another story in itself. But anyway, he goes to Tennessee. And of course, he goes there in, in, in uh, 1785, born in, in 1767. So he's 18 years old. When he, when he goes out there. All right, now let's let's start talking about what he did. How long have I been talking? About 28 minutes. Okay. Look at him. There he is. You don't want to come up against this guy. He's not going to be... He's not. Now, let me tell you, he, he made his name Primarily, not as a lawyer. <laughs> he made his name as a military man. Mm -hmm. He had no formal military training whatsoever. But he was an unbelievable military leader. Because, <laughs> for example, one thing, you know, most of the troops that he led in battle were militiamen. That is kind of like a National Guard. They weren't professional soldiers. And one of the problems with militiamen was that they would run. You know, if, 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 the, if the battle got too hot, they'd skadoodle. They'd mm -hmm. run away. Yeah. So he put a line of men behind the militiamen and told them to shoot every one of those bastards if they started running back. So they were either going to get killed, fight the enemy, or they were going to get fit, killed by their own guy. And that's the way he was. You know, uh, he had no illusions about human nature. I mean, he was a tough, rough guy. Now, the image on the right that's kind of underneath your picture, or it's underneath there on my screen, mm -hmm. this picture. This is the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, 
Well, let me, well, you, you can imagine how sympathetic Andrew Jackson would be to Native Americans. No, not, he was He not. would buy into the idea that if the Native Americans had some land that you wanted, what did you do with the Native Americans? You probably killed them or moved them. You either kill them or get rid of them or move them. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make any peace. Now, this is this image on the right, the colored image, the one that's got a little color to it. That is the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, which was his first really major military engagement. That he was he was leading Tennessee militia in that battle. It occurred in Southern Alabama. The largest number of Native Americans, these were Creek Indians, and the Creek Indians were helping the British in the War of 1812. Mm. So how do you think Andrew Jackson felt about the Creek Indians helping the British? What do no. you do with What do you do with them? Kill them. You kill them. You kill them. I mean, he has no compulsion about that. And I mean, he is he is tough and as resolute as any, anybody could be. More Indians were killed in that single battle in, I believe it was March of 1814. I know it was 1814. The Battle of Horseshoe Bend was it the river. I think it was the Tappaloose River or whatever it was in Alabama made a horseshoe. There were about a thousand Native Americans killed in that battle. It was a slaughter. And of course, the primary way that you kill people is the bayonet. So I mean, it's all a knife fight. Yeah, it was brutal. Really at brutal. Now, I'll go back up to the other one in a minute. Now, here he is standing heroically, right? Mm hmm. This is the Battle of New Orleans. Now, this is where he, see those troops with those red coats on? Yeah, the British. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Andrew Jackson led the Tennessee militia. The War of 1812 had gone very, we declared war on the British over maritime rights mm -hmm. and shipping rights. It did not go well. You know, the, yeah. the British took yeah. Baltimore, they took Washington, they burned the yeah, White Yeah, they burned House. the White House. You know, and they, yeah, just, they just were... The only really major significant victory that we had in the battle, in the War of 1812, was Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Is that where he got his nickname? That Well, his nickname was Old Hickory. Yeah. That was his nickname. They, they, and, and the reason that, that his troops gave him the, the, the because they, they trusted him. He really did identify with his troops. He was one tough cookie. And of course, Hickory is really strong wood. So that's why they called him old Hickory. Well, his militia defeated the British at the Battle of New Orleans. And that really transformed his whole image. So Battle of Horseshoe Bend, 1814, Battle of New Orleans, 1815. And then there's what's called the First Seminole War. Now, this is the same thing up here, so I'll go up here to it. You ever heard of the Seminoles? I know they're a group of Native Americans. You know, I think about them every time I see these uh, Florida State football games. Mm -hmm. And they have this student ride out there on a horse. We ought to, I, I know what Andrew Jackson would do. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't have liked that. Oh, Lord, Lord. Well, the Seminoles were in Florida. Florida was still controlled by Spain. This would have been about 1817. Uh-huh. The so-called First Florida War or the first Seminole War. Andrew, there were two things really happening. Slaves were running away and causing trouble going down among the Seminoles. And the Seminoles, of course, were Native Americans. The Spanish weren't really dealing well with the situation. So President Monroe told old Hickory, old Hickory, to go down there and do it. Well, he went down there and just blew them away. Oh. 
and and essentially the northern part of what we call Florida, the Panhandle, and across to Jacksonville, the north northern part of Florida, came under United States control because of this first Seminole War. So Andrew Jackson really built his name from that. Now, now we come to the dear old Cherokees. Oh yeah. Uh, I gotta go. I'm probably what, what's my time? Uh, like 35 minutes. You've been talking. My about. God, I'm, I'm going. I'm, I'm I'm probably not even going to finish that. That's all right. We'll do it next week. We can just do it next week. It's okay. We we'll just do it next week. All right. Now you see this pair. This this in 1819, the United States signed a treaty with the Cherokee. And they said that this, all this territory that's in the side, this red line, see, it comes way down South Carolina, yeah. Western North Carolina, goes up into Virginia. It's all goes of over Kentucky. Takes, basically all of Kentucky and virtually everything in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. This was Cherokee land and any white man who moved into that area had to get out. Yo, oh, that didn't, uh, that no, that didn't. That was signed in 1819. <laughs> yeah. Now, how do you think? Uh, how do you, how do you think the folks felt about that? The no. white folks felt about that, huh? They, they weren't happy about that. No, that's prime land. Especially if you could raise a lot of cotton on that land. Yeah, and make a lot right. of money. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't get into it in full detail, but. There's so many parallels between Trump and Jackson. You might know that Trump felt that too. He brought Andrew Jackson's portrait, uh, portrait yeah, into, into the, the Oval office. office. And it's still hanging there for another month or so until mm -hmm. you know Donald Trump uh, leaves office. But uh, he identifies with Jackson. Mm -hmm. Because I can see Jackson, that. Yeah. Jackson, in effect, said he thought the election, he he won the Electoral College and the popular vote more than anybody else in the 1824 election. But because there were three other candidates, nobody got 50%. And mm. Henry Clay, and Henry Clay hated Andrew Jackson. Henry Clay maneuvered and got John Quincy Adams to be made president. And the whole mm. issue of a stolen election, the whole thing, Andrew Jackson had the election stolen from him, got into the parts. And oh, Andrew Jackson, by this time, by the way, after these wars were over, he bought him a piece of land, made a big farm, owned a whole bunch of slaves, and if a slave ran away from his plantation, he said he would give a reward to anyone who would give that runaway slave 300 lashes. Okay. The only thing, you, you know, if somebody doesn't do what you want to do, you either kill them or beat them or do something. I mean, that's, he's tough. Yeah. He's hickory. It's a hammer. But, it's like a hammer. but he did great things for us militarily. Well, anyway, when he ran for president in 1828, he told all the white men who could vote for him, because only white men could vote then. Landholders, oh, right, too. Yeah, they had to be landowners. Mm -hmm. He told them that if we, if, if we elected him as president, he was going to get rid of the Cherokees and he was going to move them to Oklahoma. I mean, that'll be better. They'll be out in Oklahoma. Nobody wants Oklahoma anyway. It's way over there. <laughs> so we got to the Mississippi. We're just going to get them. Well, somebody said, well, what if they don't want to go? <laughs> he wouldn't care. <laughs> he didn't care. They're going to have to go. They're going to have to go. Now, this leads to what is called the Indian Removal Act. He did win the presidency in 1828. He served two terms. Andrew Jackson, and I could go on and on about Andrew Jackson, but Andrew Jackson 
1830 signed an act called the Indian Removal Act. And that meant all of this land was going to be taken over by white people and the Indians were going to have to go to Oklahoma. And it wasn't just the Cherokees. It was other Indian tribes in the Southeast as well. Now this, lead, you know, this, this, here's, there's their territory. This leads to what is known as the Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it was a gruesome situation. You know, I mean, it was uh, it was a very, very gruesome situation, and uh, the, the the eventually a small band of Cherokees that were particularly cooperative with the whites were able to stay in Western North Carolina on a very small piece of land which they actually bought themselves, which is now Cherokee North Carolina mm -hmm. where they have a casino. Yeah, I was going to say, it's still, this Cherokee it's still, it's reservation very, very, is still very there. small band, the so-called Eastern tribe of the Cherokee. Well, it is, and it's not a, um, it's not farmable land, I wouldn't say. You well, know? no, it's not, and, it, and it's, uh, but of course, the vast majority of, of Cherokees are out here in northeastern Oklahoma. That's mm -hmm. where they are, because that's what we're taking. Well, and you know, there are all of these, there, you know, there's this play up there called Under These Hills, mm -hmm. and they talk about this story and the Trail of Tears. And it, you know, Andrew Jackson, he was he was one tough cookie. I know. Now, you know, what do you do with somebody like this? I mean, here's a man who obviously was on the quote, the right side in the Revolutionary War. He was a man who indeed did through his own energies and efforts. Now, look, here's, here's an interesting thing. How much time I got left? I even talking like 42 minutes. Well, I'm going to talk two more minutes. <laughs> okay. U.S. Fine. Highway 74. You work at a place on U.S. Highway I 74. I do. That's you know, true. That is called the Andrew Jackson Highway. I didn't even know that. <laughs> well... You think about that next I, time you go I just call there. it Independence Boulevard. Well, it's the Andrew Jackson Highway. See right there where it says 74 West Andrew Jackson Highway. See that? Okay. See that? Yeah. In yellow right there. Now, down in Robinson County, you got a bunch of Lumbee Indians. Yeah. I they wanted that. Andrew yeah. Jackson's name removed from that stretch of US 74. It goes through <laughs> Robinson County. Because to them, and some of them were quoted as saying this, please excuse me, naming a highway for Andrew Jackson that goes through Robinson County would be like naming a highway that goes through Israel for Adolf Hitler. I mean, they just said, and you know. They don't you know, like you know, Andrew Jackson down there, right? No, most people, and I, it's a little blurry, but I think I can read it. Most people don't know the history. They don't know that the name of Andrew Jackson means nothing but misery to Indians. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. understand why? Yes. Can you understand why these Lumbees would be up? To, you know, yeah, I can Diana, understand they it. would. Because mm -hmm. if you go down US 74, you go down US 74 sometimes. You know that bypass that goes down there near Lumberton? Yeah, get down near Lumberton. That is called in Robinson County. You get to Robinson County. That's Lumberton. It's called the American Indian Highway. Now, what do you think about the fact that they changed that name? No, I mean I can understand it. You know. Remember those beads on the string? Yeah, right. That's that bead. Remember thing. what color beads? Remember Harriet Tubman on the twenty dollar bill. American Indian Highway, yeah. you know, and what I'll do next week, I, I, I haven't been able to do it because we're running out of time. I'm going to show you uh -huh. two or three videos, which I think okay. will reinforce this point. Remember, history is not the past. History is our interpretation of the past. Those beads, I like it, that. I like that. 
Did you, did you find this interesting? I did. Thank you very much. Well, I, I hope everybody out there understands I'm not getting involved in contemporary politics. No way, no way. I'm not using this as any political platform. I'm just telling you the facts. Right, about the a president with local connection. And, and, and what, how you interpret him. You can interpret him as a great military hero or as a butcher. Mm -hmm. Going to what B? Okay. All right. Well, Dad, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for being with us. We hope you have a, a Merry Christmas. And we will, right? And we'll, you, you know, the most important thing about Christmas are the core values that are represented in the New Testament. And to say the least, they are not synonymous with what Andrew Jackson believed. Hmm. Well. Okay, well, on that note, so we will see you all next week to continue with this uh, discussion. All right, Dad? Oh, absolutely. I'll, okay. I'll be back. All okay. right. Thanks, everybody. See Bye. Ya. Bye.